My name is Miguel Castro and I play Magnet. Jake M. Smith and I play Squid. And then Jefferson and I play X-Ray. You said? Yeah. All right, Shia LaBeouf and I play Stanley. Max Cash and I play Zigzag. Okay, my name is Byron Cotton, really. You guys already know that. I think I'm the set comedian. I'm a math daddy, you know. And then I play Armpit. I'm Cleo Thomas. I play Zero, a, um, a very quiet kid. <laughs> Zero. <laughs> Working with these kids has really been one of the high points of my life as a director because they are raw, they are, they are in some ways untrained, and yet that honesty comes across on screen. They're incorrigible, but they're at the same time very, very uh, sweet in their own way and funny and goofy. And they have some depth to them as characters. Lewis created some really interesting kids in the book that, that we were able to bring to life. We handpicked them very carefully and I thought it was going to be hard to find these delightful uh, characters in the flesh when in fact when each of the boys that uh, secured the roles walked into the audition it was as if they had just walked out of the pages of the book and into our lives they just showed up and there was x-ray and wow look at that it's like really zigzag don't move. Bam! I mean, what color was his blood? I couldn't tell. Oh, God, man, I wish I'd have seen it. Bang! Uh, hey, uh, Theodore, is there some place I can fill my canteen? My name is not Theodore. It's Armpit. There's a water spigot on the wall outside the shower. Thanks, Armpit. It's all added to him. I walked out of the Sears with a DVD player an effects machine, and they had the doors wide open for me. So I had a big car. <laughs> a dog. So what are you in for, Twitch? Oh, oh, just joyriding. It's not that I ever want to steal one or nothing, but whenever I walk past a really nice car, ooh, I just start to twitch. You think I'm jumpy now? Should have seen me in the convertible Mustang. Ooh. 26 letters. So we can do five letters a day for four days, and then six letters on the fifth day. Damn, that's good math, man. Well, I'm not stupid. I know everyone thinks I am. I just don't like answering stupid questions. In the book, Stanley's fat. And because of the rigors of production, finding a chubby boy that could then toughen up and lose weight was you know, virtually impossible to ask of a teenager. Um, the shooting schedule was all over the place. We didn't shoot in continuity, so we just couldn't have done it. So we had to put that aside and just look for a great actor. And Andy said, you know, what I really want is, you know, a young Tom Hanks. I know it's kind of corny to say that, but that's what he wanted. And the tape arrived at my house on a Saturday morning of Shia's audition, and, uh, I just called Andy and I said, you not only got a young Tom Hanks, you got a cross between Dustin Hoffman and Tom Hanks. Uh, reading the script, because things that are in the book aren't in the script, and you know, things that are in the script aren't in the book. We still stayed true to it, but uh, there were certain things that didn't apply anymore. Um, I read it after I got the role, because I, I mean, we, we went, jumped right off even Stevens into the role. And when I read it, it was addicting. And um, it's, it doesn't start off slow, it starts off quick paced. And that's what kept me reading, the, the quick-paced nature of the book. Oh, boot camp. Oh. It's crazy. We had to go to boot camp because physically, to be in, in, in Ridgecrest where we were shooting, where it's 156 degrees ground level at, in the holes, you gotta be in shape. And so, they hired this, our stunt guy, Mr. D. Mr. D. Yeah, yeah he, he was, was a trainer. We had he was to, kind of tough. Yeah, he, he was, was kind of tough. He would trick right. us into like, we had to pick a number between one and 10. Yeah. And then he would say, okay, three, if you say four, be like four minute run, let's go. Yeah, and then and if you say like, all right, pick a number from one to 30. And if you say two, all right, two second rest. And you just give you a two second rest and you're like, all right, 50 push-ups, and it'll just be incredible. We have to, yeah. it'll be crazy. We'd have to like climb up a rope and, we did shovel uh, drills. And when you're shooting in place like that, it's almost like Mars, you know? 
nobody's used to the what's going to happen. Nobody knows it's going to happen. There's dust tornadoes going on every five minutes. There's whiteouts. Like, the sand gets so, it, it gets thrown in the air, and then you can't see anything. I've never been on a movie where I've had to rehearse. Like, I'm, I'll be rehearsing, and then all of a sudden, a dust tornado will be coming towards our set. Like, you got to run in a van right away. That's never happened to me where I'm scared for, like, my safety because I'm doing a rehearsal and there's a dust tornado. Never. And that, that was what this movie was like. A lot of it's real. A lot of it's really happening. The twister that they captured, that was happening behind us. That stuff really happened. And it was about 120 degrees some days with winds up to 50 miles an hour sometimes, dust blowing. So these kids literally felt like they were in this camp. This is a map showing where all of the holes are. And it's not like we could just dig a bunch of holes. For example, in Stanley's tent, there are seven kids. Uh, Stanley comes out to dig his first hole. We see him five times during the day. We see him once, they haven't started, and then as the day goes along, the holes get deeper and deeper. Well, this means that we had to have five different phases of the holes. We had to dig those seven holes five times. So after each scene, the camera crew could like walk over there, all the kids would be in the same position, but their holes would be a little deeper, and then film them again, and then they'd move again, and we'd film them again. You done already? Don't you know, man? It's like the fastest digger in the camp. He's a mole. I think he eats the dirt. Five foot hole, he's two feet tall. How's he do it? <laughs> don't know, don't know. Don't know. <laughs> Thank you, boys, you've been a big help. Oh, get back! Oh my God! Ah! Oh. oh, this was like working with lizards. Liz lizards, yeah. They're so neat. I mean, I want to eat them and stuff, and I'd be hungry and just want to <laughs> take a bite out of it, just put it on a hot dog bun, eat a lizard. You know what I'm saying? Which he tried, by the way. <laughs> Stop it! You go out there. There's lizards all over the place. You don't know if they're gonna attack you or you know come up and pee on your shoe. You don't know what they're gonna do because you've never been around them. You know, you don't know how to deal with a lot of stuff because it's never happened. The movie takes place in Texas, but there are no lizards like this in Texas. So in our research, we found that the Australian bearded dragons gave the producers the look that they wanted for the movie. We used uh, 14 lizards. Four of them played the principal part. The rest were um, background atmosphere lizards. Uh, in the movie, they're supposed to be poisonous. Uh, in reality, they're just the most wonderful uh, reptile that you could get if you were going to have one. Yeah, they just show on you. The, like I had one sitting right here, trying to make out with my ear, it kept licking it. I mean, they like little hot dogs. Have you seen them? <laughs> but yeah, they were pretty cool. I didn't know that this was the shout-out segment on the DVD. It is. But I just wanted to say, you know, that uh, I, I think we all I think we all learned a lot on this from film each, from, each yeah. from each other. From each other. You know, me being from New York, I learned a lot of stuff from these cats being from L.A. Yeah. And uh, I really think that the movie's going to be good. I really think that Andy, the director, did a really good job on it. Yeah. And, you know, I, don't. I think yeah. that, uh, I think, you know, just I think that, low that uh, you know, I think that everyone did a, did a dope job. You'd be surprised what you can accomplish once you set your mind to it. Tim yeah. Blake Nelson. Blake Nelson. Tim Blake Nelson. Tim Blake Nelson. Nelson. Yes. Oh my God. Put it down. And give the big everyone oh, yes. razor room. Hey, everybody. Hey, Tim, Tim Blake, Tim Blake Nelson. Nelson. What's also great about what Andy Davis did is he he had the task of casting seven mostly unknown young actors, and truly seven out of seven of them are really great kids. They're great guys. I really enjoy hanging out with them. Uh, it's, it's wonderful. It's rejuvenating. Uh, and I like talking to them. And I know John and, and Sigourney feel the same way. I was just so interested in the fact that that's John Voight and I'm sitting right here and watching him act is amazing. That's incredible to me for a kid who came off Disney to watch John Voight sit here and act with you is amazing. You know, it's a dream come true. I really think he's, I say, you want to run away? Go ahead. I'm not gonna run away, Mr. Sir. Good thinking, you know, that's doesn't nobody run away from here. You know why? We got the only water for a hundred miles. Well, they're all very talented, young men, and they're all full of uh, fun, and they have many different talents. All of them are musical, and they're all like comedians, and they're, they have a nice way of dealing with each other, and they're terrific. They were very good at their jobs, they were very professional, but they still were, underneath it all, boys, boys you could relate to.
Look, I'm gonna give a shout out to Brandy Skipper and uh, all my people down there, Shanene and uh, Shanene. Oh my God, it's gonna be a 45 minute segment on Friday. Shout out to the girls, to all my babies back home. Marie, Brandy, Shanene, Brandy, 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 and I think that this uh, picture will be something they'll be proud of for all of the rest of their, their careers, whatever, wherever they go. Is this where you want to be when Jesus comes back? Can I have my letter, please? Jump for it. I'd like to make a special thanks to something in uh, this movie that's helped us all out, Cleo's hair. Because it just shows you to go that if you just, if you, if you try real hard, you keep on growing. I'll just thank my mother and my father for being the most brilliant people. And and Brianna Lamar, because I love her more than anything in the world. Oh my God. Oh. Oh. Who are these guys? You think I got no brains in my head? But if you forget to come back for Madame Zeroni, you and your family will be cursed for always and eternity. See, here's the book as it appears in the stores at this moment in time, a dazzling blend of social commentary, tall tale, and magic realism. Our daughter uh, fell in love with this book named Holes by Lewis Socker, and, um, and she came running up to me and she said, Mommy, you should play this awful person, <laughs> the warden in Holes. And I sort of glanced at it and I read uh, her making these boys dig holes in the desert. You know, she stood there, you know, this sort of shapely redhead. And um, I have to say, it was, I, I read the book after I was sent the uh, script, but I never forgot. She loved that book. Her whole generation just loves the book. And the fact that, that they had gone ahead and, and, and gotten Lewis to write the script, I thought was such a, a great move. I, I moved from, from San Francisco to Texas in 1991. And the hardest part was just the long, hot summers. Uh, you know, you, you kind of expect it to be hot in, in July and August. But it's still, when the summers just drag on to September and October, and it's 95 degrees out, I just, it's just really miserable. And when I first started writing Holes, I, I just was writing about the heat. I just, it was almost like therapy. And I imagined this, this boot camp for kids where they'd have to dig under the hot sun every day. And the story just kind of grew from that. I, I had the place before I had any of the characters, but it was never my intention to make it a grim story. It was always going to be a kind of a fun adventure story. So I knew from the beginning that, that, they, that even though they were digging to build character, that there really there'd be buried treasure and that there'd be an escape and all that. But the story just sort of, you know, just grew as I wrote. Well, Miss Catherine, I guarantee that roof for five years, if there's anything else. The windows won't open, and the children and I would enjoy a breeze now and then. I can fix that. My writing routine is a lot different from when I was writing a novel to writing a screenplay. When I write a novel, I write maybe only for the first draft, maybe an hour, hour and a half a day. And on any day, if if somebody asked me, you know, how to go today, I probably would have said, oh, nothing. Yeah, you know, it was a wasted day. I didn't do anything. It took me a year and a half to write holes, doing a few pages a day. And somehow all those wasted days, when you put them together, it turns into something. 
And during that whole time, I never talked to anyone about what I'm working on, never told my wife or my daughter anything about the book. If, you know, I might say, you know, after six months, I might say, I, I finished the first draft today. And then, you know, after a year and a half, I probably did five drafts and finally let someone else see it. With the screenplay, it's a much more collaborative effort. One of the joys of making the movie to me was working with Lewis Sacker, who, you know, originally said, oh, gosh, I don't know anything about Hollywood, and I'm afraid I've heard horror stories about what's happened to writers who sell their books to Hollywood filmmakers and producers. And I made a commitment to myself and to Teresa Tucker Davies, who's really responsible for finding the book holes and the little blank of the producers of the movie, uh, that I was going to make Lewis a part of the making of the movie because I didn't want to make a movie that was about a wonderfully appreciated book that didn't reflect the book, whose author said, I don't want anything to do with this. Well, my, my first uh, touch with the book actually came from Andy Davis, who I'd worked on several movies t you know, together with. And when Andy sent me the book, it, it was it's so different from everything I've done before. Uh, I love the idea of going back and doing a children's story because I have a four-year-old and I, you know, it's, it'd be great actually to come home and say, hey, here's a movie that, you know, you can see. And yet it's, it's a book that touches everybody, you know. And forget the fact that it was on the bestseller list for a number of years. Um, I mean, Lewis Sacker has really hit a nerve in a lot of kids. So when we, were, we, when we met Lewis and convinced him that we should be the ones he should sell the rights to the, the book to, we started looking for a screenwriter. And I said, hold it, I'm a visual director. You know, I was a cameraman. I've worked with a lot of writers on a lot of scripts. I will work with you, and you will write the script. And we will figure out together how to take your story and your characters and your settings and make it into a movie. Morris Menke is a schmuck. You know, I'd never been on a movie set before. I've just been totally impressed by everyone, especially Andy Davis. His, his patience, his control, his ideas, you know, shooting different scenes from different angles and telling each actor how to, how to play it and, and keeping it all moving. And I don't think I even ever realized what a director did before. He goes like this and the thing spins, right? And as it spins, it goes like this, right? That's really good. Now, now, now it's up again, right? I've never worked with anyone like Andy who took so much responsibility for every single person's welfare. I mean, the first day we went out there, he drove us out there. He wanted John and Tim and I to see where it was, um, where we were going to be shooting, and he gave us all this sunblock and, you know, the talk about the water and the hats and everything. And he was so fatherly to us. I'm lucky to be the son of an actor. Did you say Zerodi? Sure did. My father, Nate Davis, is actually in the movie. He plays Henry Winkler's father. Then John will just play when you're very excited, you know what I mean? I was thinking maybe I'd rove her. Excuse me? You did not. I don't let anyone <laughs> drive my car. I think maybe I just walked over him. <laughs> <laughs> Having John Voight around, who has a, a big part in the movie, was very inspirational for both the kids and for John. And I think John has created something which is really quite magical. Well, Andy and I have seen each other over the years, and we were looking to work together. We talked about it, and then this came up, and he uh, gave me a call. And I'm very happy working with him. He's a wonderful man, Andy, and uh, I think that he's and he's a wonderful filmmaker. This has been a very happy experience for us. What's not to say about Andy Davis? He's a genius, man. The Fugitive. It's an incredible film. You know what I mean? Every film that he's done has that Andy flavor to it. It's an interesting way of directing, too. He's creating this character with you because it's his baby and it's your baby, and you guys got to find a way to get through this and make a movie. He expresses himself so well that he gets things done, you know? He talks to the grips like, you know, like they're people. You know, it's not like he's going, it's not like he's going, oh, handle this, handle this. He knows everything going on. I think Shia is a tremendously talented actor. And I related to Shia as, as mature an actor as I've ever worked with. And he brought great things to the part, and it was wonderful working with him. I always thought of the warden as a strong, quiet person who, instead of yelling and shouting to get people to toe the line, all she has to do is just say, excuse me, and everyone just does what she says. 
Sigourney is basically a, a real double-faced character who can seem very sweet and endearing when, when somebody finds something in the ground that she thinks may relate to the treasure of Kate Barlow. And Sigourney Weaver it just does it perfectly. She just, she just seems to have completely understood that character from the beginning and just seems to have that power. And, and she's, she's feminine, yet tough, and it's, uh, it's just a great combination. Oh, no, I'm fine. I have plenty. Excuse me? I might have uh, uh, drinking some. Thank you. May I have your canteen, please? Oh, God. This is such a wonderful story for kids and grown-ups. Um, and the idea that this boy ends up in, in this terrible place and after trying to help a friend and believing in his own instincts manages to bring this whole group of people out of this terrible situation into a situation of hope. Seeing this, the movie being made has just been a great experience. I think that one day, you know, one day I was typing these words and, and the next, you know, three years later, this whole thing is happening. It's just, it's just been amazing. We're not all gonna be together anymore after Everybody dreams of finding the great book to make a movie out of. And I think that I was lucky enough to find it.